Okay. Gonna go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Strengthening Your Defenses. Minimize uh, minimize the damages of online attack through authentication hygiene. I'm Michelle Troja, and I will be your breakout room host this morning. I have a few housekeeping items to review, and then we'll get right to the presentation. First, all participants' cameras and mics should be turned off for the duration of the presentation to minimize distractions. If you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, please utilize the chat feature to submit those. Our speaker will address questions at the end of his presentation. We are recording this presentation as well as other workshops available. These recordings will be available for on-demand viewing on FSCJ's website later this month. Finally, the best way to view today's session is in the speaker view. You can change your view settings by accessing the view option in the upper right-hand side of your video window and making that selection. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Daniel Sullivan. Daniel is the Information Security Director for First Florida Credit Union. He's worked in IT and security for more than 20 years with most of his experience in the financial services and nonprofit sectors. He holds a bachelor's of science in information systems and earned multiple certifications such as CISSP and GSEC. Daniel is a member of Jacksonville InfraGuard. Ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Sullivan. Thanks very much, Michelle. And thank you to all for who have chosen to come to this uh, presentation. It's very important. So I have up on the screen that uh, what looks like to be a very long title, and it really is. But it addresses an important aspect of our digital lives that's often ignored. The key to the title you see up on the screen is that middle part, minimize the damage. There are things we have control of in our digital lives and things we don't. Using authentication hygiene to minimize the impact of an online attack is absolutely one of those things we can all do. I hope to help you understand why this is important and show you a few things to help make your digital lives a bit better. When I talk about authentication, this is something we do every single day. For example, I, Daniel Sullivan, get to prove to other humans that I am actually Daniel Sullivan. This can be done naturally through sight. People recognize me with their eyes. Uh, through sound, people hear uh, my voice through their ears. And they may know something about me, like that car I just got out of is probably mine. But there are those, thing, those people who don't know anything about me. So sometimes I have to prove myself using something like a driver's license or a passport. On the other side of authentication, we have all forms of authenticated systems or automated systems rather, uh, like websites and, and ATMs and cars and so on. Those methods for authentication uh, are totally different from humans. Uh, they have to take some, site, some type of structured information that's secret or unique and decide if access to an account or a resource should be granted. Traditionally, this has been done with passwords as the primary basis for authentication, but I can also pr prove uh, myself to those things like my smartphone right here, uh, that uh, I am who I say I am based on the fingerprint matching or on the front of the camera, looking at my face structured in a certain way. Remember though, that even these devices, the ones we've had for, for a decade or more, uh, still fall back to passwords when all the other methods have failed or there's some kind of uncertainty in your identity. So that answers what I mean by authentication. But when I say something like authentication hygiene in connection with security, it might sound a bit strange. I, I know I get weird looks from my wife when I talk about that kind of thing. So in this context, all hygiene really means is to maintain consistent and secure habits. In daily life, we often have a continual battle with either making something secure or making something work. 
Those things are always at odds with each other. Those choices, when it comes to authentication, have a direct impact on the difference between an attacker getting into your accounts or not. What we really want to do is maintain a balance between those two things. Yes, it can mean better passwords, but that really is not the number one problem we have out there. In talking with many people, I find this security stuff tends to be very stressful uh, because all the terms and the hoops we have to go through uh, can be a little bit daunting. In this presentation, I will give you a few tips to help you with better authentication hygiene in the hopes of it helping to strengthen your own defenses. My tips may help reduce that stress and it could also possibly make you more productive. So let's get started on this. Every day on the internet, there are thousands, if not millions of attacks happening against individuals and companies. Most of those attacks are not significant, but some are substantial. Most are for financial gain. Most of those attacks are for financial gain. And some are just innocent mistakes. And few are to send a political message, while others are just for fun. In the end, chances are that you will not be directly targeted by an attacker. I repeat that again. You will not be targeted by an attacker directly. However, you are much more likely to be grouped together with other victims due to some trait you have in common. A wide variety of companies we do business with uh, have our information and some kind of attack on those businesses is inevitable. The castle you see here on the screen had builders who understood the inevitability of attacks. Castles are stationary targets designed to slow down intruders from getting to the jewels inside. It has no ability to control who is attacking and how they attack. If they did, the castle probably would have been built in the clouds or put on wheels or something like that. But obviously those defensive mechanisms are not much of an option. So the castle's builders focused on what they could control the vulnerabilities and obstacles to counter those attacks that they see. The castle here uses a strategy we still talk about today known as defense in depth. This castle you see here has multiple layers of defenses. There is a moat around the perimeter of the castle. There are hardened and high walls or what's left of them in this picture right here. It has multiple layers of walls on the inside, the outside, this building here has walls. And there are guard towers to watch for an attacker on the outside of the castle. Just the daunting task of breaching this castle's security would hopefully make a would-be attacker move on to an easier castle. But if someone were to attempt a breach, hopefully one of the layers will give the castle's owners enough time to react. Putting this into current world terms, building our own castle is how we minimize the damage that occurs when an attack happens to our digital lives. What is inside our personal castle is usually access to financial accounts, our own social identity, or just simply sensitive information. We just hope that various companies which hold our information will react quickly when they see something anomalous and be very forthcoming when an attack does impact us in some way. The good news at this time is that what we only have to, that we only have to be slightly better in terms of security than the person next to us. That is, when you're running away from the bear, you only need to be faster than the person next to you. Attackers are so busy with everyone who gets security wrong that there's little motivation to dig into those who get it right. I'm gonna give you four tips to strengthening your defenses. But first, does the following hypothetical scenario sound familiar in your own daily life? In browsing around the web, you come across a news website with a flashy article that just has to be read. So you click on the article. Just as you get started on reading that juicy content, you're told that you need an account. But that's such a bother. What do you do? Do you go on your way or do you sign up for the free article so you can find out about that swarm of flying insects? Of course you sign up. So the eye right now is on this screen right here, the sign up page. The silly sign up form is in your way. All you want to do is read that one single free article. So let us get this formality over with as quickly as possible. 
In the fields you see here is an email address. So you put your regular email address in there and a username, and then a standard password, whatever that might be. And with some simple information entered, you have exactly what you wanted. The article on flying ants is all yours to read, but there's one major problem with what we just did. You just provided your standard password to yet another website. That often used one password is your only proof to websites that you are who you say you are. It could be on two or five or 10 or 20 websites. And as you increase the number, the risk of losing control of the standard password also greatly increases. Using that same password isn't inherently an issue only if 100% of those websites who have your password are fully secure and do the right thing. Let me give you another practical example. A few weeks ago, I was driving around St. John's County with my wife and had a hankering for a, a Sonic watermelon slushy. Looking at Sonic's website, I saw a note that I could order through their mobile app on my smartphone and receive 50% off. I mean, who wouldn't want that kind of deal? So I downloaded the app and then I was told I had to create an account to proceed. Of course, I have to enter my email address and my new password. This all makes sense since you know, putting in credit card information uh, needs to be secured and Sonic wants someone to send marketing emails too. But really all I wanted was that watermelon Sonic slushy 50% off. Do I really need to create a brand new password just for this? I'm totally tempted to just reuse a standard password, but the reality is that those other companies would need to be trusted to keep my, my secret password safe. I know that reusing my password is a huge risk. Many popular companies have proven that they cannot hold our passwords properly. And a number of them didn't disclose or don't disclose until years later that the, that the passwords have been compromised. If we can't rely on a company with a moderately sized security budget, how can we rely on that lowly news website that publishes articles about swarms of flying ants? Up on the screen are only two examples of popular websites out of hundreds and thousands that have been breached. Millions of passwords were lost years prior to discovery or disclosure. There are hundreds and possibly thousands of websites out there that don't even know that they have, uh, have been breached and they don't have the resources to secure your password pro properly. So what harm could actually come from our standard password being in all those breaches? Here's how it could go down. Attackers can buy or find collections of stolen and breached login credentials. In 2020, there was an estimate of 15 billion usernames and passwords in existence. Uh, and with only 5 billion of those found to be unique. The attackers, utilize automation, sometimes called bots, to try those stolen credentials against popular websites. The tactic there is known as credential stuffing. When a credential is found to work on a website, this goes into a list for sale or is set aside to be exploited in some other way. So credential stuffing is a simple and effective attack because an email address is often also the username. We see credential stuffing widely used across a large swath of websites and is suspected to be one of the major methods for account compromise. Here's a real life example of how credential stuffing has occurred. November 20, I'm sorry, November 12th, 2019, the streaming service Disney Plus opened up the doors for subscriptions to be purchased. It received 10 million subscriptions in the first 24 hours. Of course, each subscriber needed to enter a username and password. Three days later, November 15th, more than 100,000 accounts were found for sale on the dark web, selling for three to $11 each. We don't know how many actually were sold, but we know for a fact that 100,000 were found and that they were mostly valid. Those 100,000 credentials up for sale didn't happen because Disney Plus was hacked. It was due to Disney Plus subscribers who were reusing passwords between websites. Some attacker on the internet somewhere used some automation to check 
email addresses and password combinations against Disney Plus that they found in some list somewhere else. This real life example goes to show if you reuse a password on multiple websites, it only takes a compromise of any of those websites to take out the rest. We've seen many companies can't hold secrets and how our own habits can work against us. So our authentication hygiene tip number one seems pretty obvious. Do not ever reuse passwords. If you make a new account, make a unique password. If you follow this tip, you can nullify the impact of any website breach or lost password down to exactly one single website, just that one account. A great place to see if you have an issue with a password reuse is a website called Have I Been Pwned. Ernie mentioned that at, during the break. This is a well-known, reputable website run by a security researcher named Troy Hunt out of Australia. And you can do a few things in there. Here are some of the things you can do. You can monitor an email address and receive notification should a breach be found. Of course, it is only one perspective, so it does not mean it's not insurance. It doesn't mean they're scouring the dark web. It's just that he happened to find that and your email address is there. You can check if a password has been found in a breach. And you can also check if a, an email account is found in a breach as well. Let me show you the three features there. So here's the site right here. In the very beginning of the site, when you go to have I been pwned, and by the way, pwned is hacker speak for owned or pawned. Uh, this is an email address that I can enter in. So I can enter in dsullivan at firstflorida.work, which is my work address. And in here, when I scroll down, I see that there are a number of breaches that were found. Now it shows you compromised data. It would be email address, employer name information, physical address, social media profiles, which I have none on this. This does not mean that I have a breach of my account. It simply means that the information found in these locations have my information in it. And I can probably expect to see, well, since it is my work email address, probably can expect to see some spam coming in my way where I can get unsolicited phone calls or really just about anything can come my way, but it doesn't mean I actually have a compromise. There are a number of uh, accounts uh, in here, or rather breach lists that does show your password has been compromised. In those cases, you probably would want to change your password and you might actually receive a notification from that particular uh, owner of the website. Other things you can do in here is notify me. This is where I can put my email address in. And if there is any list that comes along with uh, my email address in it, I will be notified and it will show the same information as I have down here when I was put my email address in that one time. It's just a, a way of, of looking at it through the list here. And then the other thing I can do is passwords. Now with this, uh, I can put in my standard password if I'd like to. I would highly recommend that you read through right here, the privacy, just to make, understand what's happening. Just know that the password that you play, type in here is not being sent to the website. It is sending a representation of the password, but there's still a little bit of risk that goes on there. Feel free to put something in there and you can see whether your password has been found in a list. If it is found in the list, it doesn't mean that your account is breached. It just means that your password is found in a breach that someone has used in the past. Passwords though, if you use a properly sized one, or we'll talk about that later, but if you use a password uh, that is unique, it shouldn't be found in this list at all. If I type in something like password, I will see that password is found 3.8 million times by others. If I add a one into there, 2.4 million times. That's how many people have used password and password one. So this is a good research site just to look at your own uh, security posture. If I have convinced you that reusing passwords between websites is bad, the next thing you might say to me, Dan, I have 50 websites. Am I really supposed to remember all those passwords 
And to that I answer, no, absolutely not. Authentication hygiene tip number two, use a password manager or password vault. They're the same kind of thing. They just go by different names. There's no standardization. This is a centralized pardoned mobile app or website designed to store passwords. There are tons of features that save you time and only increase your security. Some features could include sharing only uh, specific passwords with whom you choose. So you can share uh, your Netflix password with only one person if you want to, without you having to intervene in that. Creating long random passwords is an option in this type of thing. So you don't have to think about those passwords like with the, the idea behind that slushy that I wanted uh, from, from Sonic. I didn't have to think of a password. I just had my password vault do that. It could autofill passwords on login pages. So you don't have to go through the, the hassle of typing things in. It can monitor an alert on a password found in the dark web. So it effectively does kind of the same thing as what you saw with Have Been Pwned. It just is a, it does it from a different perspective. An added bonus of using a password vault is that you can have some estate planning type features built in where a trusted group of people can trigger a process to gain access to needed credentials should you become available. It's, it's really great in a power of attorney type of situation where you suddenly become incapacitated and your significant other or family can't get into these accounts and they need to pay bills. Each vault does this different. So if this feature is important to you, look carefully at how it's implemented. Now, I personally have hundreds and hundreds of unique passwords, which are stored in my vault. I never need to memorize a single one of those. And I go through minimal effort to get them set up. Also, my wife has full access to our family Netflix account, our banking credentials without ever having to coordinate anything uh, with that. If she wants to know how to get into any shared account, I just tell her to look in the password vault. I don't have to remember anything uh, like the random password in that, uh, that's, that Sonic uh, Watermelon Slush account. Uh, if someone, but if someone does breach Sonic's uh, website, then I have exactly one website that I have to worry about. It's that Sonic website uh, because I do this method. Now, a small word of warning. If you do go with a password manager, please make sure to use a reputable one. There are dozens of them out there. Sometimes you can even think of hundreds of them out there, but few of them have had their claims of security independently verified. The three I have up on the screen are pretty prominent in this space. They've had a lot, a lot of security researchers look at them. If you ever want to find if a website has been independently verified, or if there is a problem with it, just do a search for the password vault's name and then do a space and then type in breach or verified or something like that. And you can usually find some information about this. If you're tech savvy and want to manage your own password database, I highly recommend using something, not necessarily this one, but you could use something like KeePass. KeePass is spelled K-E-E-P-A-S-S. -S. You can store your password, sorry, you can store your database in a Dropbox like location to synchronize your passwords across multiple devices. Just know that if you lose control of your master password, then there is no one to fix that situation. Pa KeePass is a free and open solution on just about every platform. And I wanna show you a little bit of KeePass. Now this is just KeePass, this is on my Windows system. I also have this available to me on my Android or iPhone. Uh, it can be on two or three other places as well. I only have one account in here, which is a firstflorida.org account, which actually is our Google account. And I can open up uh, the accounts.google.com just to show you this. I'm double clicking on that. And I'm going to hit a key combination. In this case, it's the key combination control A. And I just auto logged in. I have a very long password there. It's totally random. I don't know it. It's in my vault, but I just logged in with only hitting one button or one set of buttons. So that's a, an option. I don't recommend that for those who are, are inexperienced with this kind of thing. 
I would still stick with the various paid options. There are free demos that you can also get through. I believe LastPass does a free demo or, or does a, a certain restrictions. It's not terribly expensive per year though. It, it is highly recommended. Always remember that all security mechanisms such as passwords have weaknesses. Attackers are continually looking for these weaknesses and methods on how to achieve their goal. It is just a matter of time and resources before the attackers find what they need. To significantly strengthen your defenses, authentication hygiene tip number three is to turn on multi-factor authentication. This is also sometimes called two-factor authentication or two-step verification. They're called different things because of technicalities, but really you want to have any of those things enabled, not simply a username and password. That's the goal here. Get, the, get one of those things enabled for you. Quite simply, multi-factor authentication allows a website or automated system to require two or more ways of proving your identity. Before you immediately say this is too much, know that often websites use multi-factor authentication methods, which adapts the level of verification based on a trusted device and actually can make signing onto an app or website easier, not harder. For example, those who use First Floor Credit Union's mobile banking app will know that once a username and password is entered, code is sent to a device or account as a second factor. Though, if the device used is trusted, that second factor code is not sent, is not needed. And also, because you have a trusted device, you can use a fingerprint on the mobile app uh, as a form of convenience for authenticating. So that's an example where the security profile has gone up and then it goes right back down because you have a trusted device and it makes authentication much easier. This diagram here shows some ways we can authenticate. You already know about the password. I've been talking about that. Uh, there's a secret code that you uh, know and you have to share with the website. Uh, a password's primary weakness though is that they can be stolen from a distance or can be guessed in some way. Thus an attacker can try passwords with ease. They can be shared, all kinds of problems. But that's something that we've been doing for decades at this time. Number two is using something you are for proof of identity, like a fingerprint, is much more challenging to steal. Even cheapest smartphones now have fingerprint readers on the back for unlocking, or front back, or sometimes the front actually, uh, for unlocking various apps and features. Though we're starting to see more of a move towards facial recognition from the camera on many of the high-end phones. In either case, accuracy is a technical challenge for these sensors to overcome. And so they're rarely a primary method for authentication in those most applications. So you still have to go back to the password. And then number three is a, a, a factor that you prove that you have something, which is usually just proving ownership of an email address, phone number, mobile app. Uh, you'll see these uh, with a rotating code by text message sometimes, or you have to click a button on a mobile app because you're logging in through your, your laptop or something like that. That's the, uh, have you, you have something, you have ownership of that. If multi-factor authentication is enabled in the correct places, it can be a showstopper against breaching your own castle walls. If you want to give this a try, here is my opinion on the order of where you should begin and start slow. Number one, I would recommend focusing your efforts on your email accounts first. Remember that your email account is the de facto place where password resets go and is the primary means for communications. If an attacker gets access here, they can get to almost anywhere. Likewise, absolutely have uh, multi-factor authentication enabled on any password vault that you have. If you can't use multi-factor, for a vault, then it's probably time to find a new vault. Number two, make sure that multi-factor authentication is enabled for online and mobile banking for all of your financial accounts. Attackers are known to be primarily money motivated. That's where we see a vast majority of our attacks. So having this feature enabled 
helps to put up a roadblock when compromising important accounts. Again, if your financial institution does not support multi-factor authentication, maybe it's time to find a new institution. First Florida would love to have you. Number three, major shopping sites with stored credit card details like Amazon and Walmart usually have multi-factor options available. I was just looking at Walmart, they call it two-step uh, verification. That's fine. Put it on there if you can. Lastly, number four, add multi-factor authentication on all your social media or other accounts which have any kind of value to you. Just remember that we want to have multiple layers of authentication hygiene involved in minimizing the damage and having two uh, factors for authentication should be one of those tools to use. Start out slow and see how it goes. Now, I wanted to show you uh, the multi-factor authentication on Google real quick, since I already logged into the account. I'm not gonna actually enable it, but here, when, what I did is I went to accounts.google.com is the website. It actually redirected me as my.google.com. But if you look for, uh, for this, you can find, when you log in on the left side, there is a security feature. And when I scroll down a little bit, two-step verification is right there. You can even use your phone to sign in. Those are some very strong forms of authentication and can be useful for multi-factor authentication as well. Google has it done, but it's not on by default. So you have to actually go to the site, accounts.google.com will take you there. The last tip I have for authentication hygiene is really just about passwords in general. And now I'm absolutely not going to bore you with yet another method on how to construct the perfect password. There are way too many of those out there. And most of them I feel have outdated, unfounded, complex advice that does not make any sense, doesn't make any sense from what I, I, I see. Passwords of a certain length and character types like letters, numbers, symbols, and change requirements every 90 days. Uh, are kind of meaningless to the average person for the various accounts that you use. Each website we use has its own uh, security requirements. And so it really doesn't matter anyway to your overall defense as long as you follow the four tips I'm laying out today. The most meaningful piece of advice I can give for password composition is to think in long passphrases. The longer, the better. That's what we care about is the length. Using a password vault from tip number two removes the need to even remember the passphrase at all. However, if you can't use a vault, a long passphrase is something which can at least be remembered or typable. Check out this classic uh, XKCD cartoon on the right side of the screen on passphrase creation. The top set of cells uh, shows what looks like a complex password, which is easy to guess and hard to remember. The bottom set of cells shows a passphrase that is hard to guess and easy to remember. Though don't use correct horse battery staple in any of your passwords because that's what attackers guess. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't wanna use that one. Uh, but the idea is to use random words that have no meaning together or in your life. The fact is that an attacker trying a password attempt with a single character off will fail. There's no question about that. Simply adding the number of characters to a password exponentially increases the chances of failure for an attacker. That's just simple math. Just always remember that longer passwords is always better. Here, I just wanted to show you one site uh, called Password Haystacks. This just shows you some of the basic math behind it. Now, it, it does make a few assumptions uh, that attackers are going to eliminate types of passwords. They're not going to go through dictionaries. They're going to do all these things. But it kind of just shows you the math behind password attacks from an online attack scenario. If they had a, uh, if they're able to go through a database of passwords, it kind of just shows you this type of thing. So if I type in the word password, it could show you that it could take 6.91 years if they're doing an online attack scenario, 1,000 guesses per second. If I add in another character, it goes to centuries. Um, actually, if it did characters like that, yeah, it goes to centuries. Another character, 
exponentially. It increases every character I add in there. You can even use spaces. Spaces are valid characters in, in most cases. Some websites have this problem. Uh, but don't feel free to use spaces. It's fine, not a problem. But just make them as long as you can. That's all. That's the whole point of this thing. So if you do a search for uh, GRC Haystack or Password Haystacks, you'll find this site, and you can just play with it if you want to see the math behind it. So there are your four tips for authentication hygiene. Here's a quick recap, recap of those. Tip number one, never ever reuse passwords on more than one website. There's a reason why that is number one. Make sure each of those accounts uses a unique password. This brings the possibility of an account compromise down to exactly one website, not all the ones that you use a password for. Tip number two, to allow or to help allow unique passwords per website, use a reputable password vault like LastPass, 1Password, Dashlane. I've heard, uh, RoboForms out there. There's a few other ones I, I haven't done research on. Uh, you know, Norton has a password vault. There's all kinds of things out there, but just do some research on it. You can get some great features like auto login to, to websites. Uh, they'll be doing some dark web monitoring for any breaches. Uh, be able to securely share accounts with a significant other without having to coordinate that password. It is a key uh, tool that you can use to help secure everything that you have. Tip number three, use multi-factor authentication where everywhere you can. Start at the most important places, your email account and password vaults, financial accounts, shopping sites, which have your credit card information stored, and then everything else of value and start slow, try it out. It's not a problem if you can't use multi-factor authentication on one thing, try it on as many as you can, just start slow. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a leap. And then tip number four, finally, use long passphrases to remove the possibility of guessing and allow some memorization if you can't use a password vault. Follow these tips and you can certainly reduce the impact of any breach or online attack to any of your accounts. So I have here on the screen, my contact email. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. No problems at all. Okay, at this time, we'll um, go ahead and start the Q&A portion of the presentation. Um, Daniel, do you want me to um, ask folks to unmute so you they can ask their questions or would you prefer the questions in the chat? Uh, yes, send them through the chat here. That'd be fine. Okay. Okay. So if you have a question, now's the time to ask them on the chat. I see one pass one question there. Uh, if we have used one password for many accounts, do we need to go change everything? I would absolutely say yes. You have one now, go change it now. You can use that same list that I had before. Uh, this list here, right there. This also applies to changing your account, your accounts. So if you have the same password for all the different things, first change your email accounts and your password vaults, then your financial institutions, then your shopping sites, and then your social media. This is the same list that I also do for any sort of instant response for any, any individual who has had a breach of some kind will compromise. I start here at these places and then I go down the list. All right, is there any easy way to delete accounts at random websites that you don't really use? Probably, well, there are, I have seen some services out there that do that kind of thing. I don't know if I would want to do that. Um, if you know, uh, a lot of reputable websites will allow you to close your account, although they don't make it easy. So if you want to, get rid of an account effectively so no one else can get into it, feel free to change the password into something random. That's one way of doing it. It, it all depends upon the site's privacy policy as to what they do with your information as well. So that's a little bit of a challenge. So whatever terms that you agreed to, they may or may not delete the information you have there. So really just, it's kind of individual to each website. There's no, no standard for it from what I understand.
I'm gonna give another 30 seconds here to see if anyone else had any questions. I, I have a, another set of things that may be of interest as well, since we have a little bit more time. I'm going to go into uh, another set of tips. I, I'm very privacy centric with the various advice that these are not directly related to authentication hygiene, but I think that they could be of use. And these are my opinion. And I recommend you explore these, these options. I recommend them for most people, but it is really up to you to do the research, to see if it fits what you are trying to do. So don't take this advice blindly. <laughs> <laughs> but it really isn't. There is nothing in here that is out, outlandish. The first tip that I have, unrelated tip number one, emergency folder printed and locked. Now, I recently went through, uh, I, I've been through actually two deaths in my family where I have been the executor and have had to try and figure out all the information. In one of those, I knew most of the information. In another one, I know absolutely nothing. <laughs> So this absolutely helps with a, a death situation. It helps with uh, instructions. I recommend emergency folder be printed out and put somewhere that is locked, that is known. It's the same place you would put your power of attorney, you put your will, you put wherever. And I have a list for my wife of all of my accounts, as well as the institutions that they're at, as well as the contact information on how to take over those accounts if needed. I put in some of the most critical passwords that uh, I need to have taken care of at that time, as well as QR codes, because some of the multi-factor authentication has a rotating code that's sitting on the phone, and you need a QR code to enroll your phone to do that multi-factor authentication. So I print those off so that she can then put it onto her own phone and get into those accounts. So I have that, I frequently update it. Number two, and this one is controversial. It, do not give in to knowledge-based questions. What I'm talking about here is uh, when you type in a username and password in a website, I see we have five minutes left. Okay. Yes. When you, when you type in a, knowledge, uh, a username and password, uh, you uh, type in something that you know and something you know. And then on the next screen, there may be another question such as, what is your childhood dog? or what is the school that you went to when you were in second grade? Those are also knowledge-based questions. Those are things that you know. And the problem with those is that you may not type it in the correct way, but also people can do research on those things for you. Uh, so that is a, a, a huge problem. You can have the absolute best password imaginable, totally random, you have no idea where it is, but sometimes you can do a password reset where it asks you those knowledge-based questions as an, a substitute for your password and then thus resetting your password for you. So it's a kind of a side channel type of thing to get around the initial protection that you have. So what I do is I type in random junk into those locations or I put in totally false information. I then store that information into my password vault so that I can get access to it when I'm asked those things. That is one method of going around this. I recommend that, but you need to do research on, on whether that makes sense for you. Number three, plant your flag. Uh, what I'm talking about here is there are accounts that are available for you to access on the internet. And those accounts uh, only need some basic personal information, such as social security number, sometimes account information. Go, Social Security Administration allows you to log in, or allows you to enroll with just your, with some information. Anyone can do it, but it shows uh, what your, um, it allows you to sub submit forms. It allows you to look at various uh, things that you don't need a, a, a non-authorized person to see. Same thing for USPS, the allow, there's an informed delivery type of thing which takes a snapshot of the front of any mail that comes to your house. Financial accounts, if you don't have an online banking for a financial account, uh, I would recommend going and enrolling on the website because all it really takes a lot of times is just social security number, maybe an account number, maybe one other piece, and that's it. Get the thing tied down so that you plant your flag and you don't allow someone else to get into it. Um, there's a great article from Brian Krebs. He's a good blogger for security. 
just search for Brian Krebs, plant your flag, you'll see an article about that. Number four, ask your financial institution to add a passcode for calling in. Uh, again, this is the same as the knowledge-based questions. A person can social engineer a, uh, a person on the phone to try and get around procedures for authenticating you. So have a passcode that is not connected to you. It's not your maiden's, mother's maiden name. It's not your address. It's not those things that are common. Something that's unique. You can store that in the password vault and use that to tie down that, that, that other vector for attack. So, so if someone tries to call in as you impersonating you, they can't do it. Freeze your credit for free. Uh, it's now free. Go to Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. And I believe you can also freeze at other ones. Uh, I think it's Check System is another one. There's Novus. I think it's a, third, it's a fifth one. Uh, there's no reason any human shouldn't have that credit freezen, frozen unless they are constantly doing accounts, uh, creating new accounts, getting new cards all the time. It's really easy to unthaw for a day. Uh, I would do it. Six, retrieve your credit report from annualcreditreport.com. That is not freecreditreport.com. This is the one that is government mandated. Um, and you can get up to one per year from the three major uh, bureaus. I like to do mine uh, from each one of them once every four months. So I'll do Equifax four months later, Experian four months later, TransUnion. And then the last one, take advantage of IRS IP PIN. This is a pilot program that they just opened, IRS just opened up to everyone in the, in the United States. Uh, it allows a, a random digit code to be sent along with your tax returns. Most of the time tax returns is a, is a rush, a flood to whoever gets to the person's social security number and submits a false claim first. And they're the ones who get the tax return. Use the IP pin program. Just do a search for IRS IP pin. You get enrolled every year, you get a rotating code off their website. It's very easy to, to set up and get that taken care of. And that's the seven unrelated tips that I have. We might have some time. I don't think we will. I doubt we will. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you guys in the uh, main session. Thank you, everyone.